Hello everyone, my name is Turner Sanderson. I am a certified nutrition support clinician. Uh, and today I'm gonna to be talking with you about the optimal management for a patient with type two diabetes requiring enteral nutrition. So starting off, important question to ask is, why is it important to manage hyperglycemia? Well, there's, there's a lot of things that make it important. First of all, uh, Hyperglycemia in the hospital has been linked to increased morbidity, mortality, and length of stay. Uh, furthermore, diabetes is the primary cause for uh, non-traumatic lower limb amputations in the United States. Um, also, a few other things with hyperglycemia in hospital, hospitalization for the critically ill patient, it can affect wound healing, uh, it can increase risk for sepsis. Uh, it can lead to congestive heart failure. Um, it can, in some cases, lead to a transplant rejection. Uh, and once again, it leads to increased uh, length of stay, particularly if the patient's um, critically ill, they have hyperglycemia, uh, that can, once again, lead to an increased length of stay. So we want to manage hyperglycemia. Now, how, how is hyperglycemia um, are diabetes defined? Uh, there are actually four diagnostic criteria that can be used. Uh, one of, uh, I would say, a more common one that is used in the clinical setting is your A1C. Uh, your A1C is a measurement of someone's blood glucose levels over a three-month period. Uh, for A1C, for someone to be diagnosed as type 2 diabetic, uh, their A1C is going to be uh, greater than or equal to 6.5%. Um, the other method is for, di for diagnosing uh, diabetes is going to be taking a fasting glucose. And for that, uh, if a patient has a fasting glucose greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter, then they would meet the diagnostic criteria for type 2 diabetes. Uh, another one is a two-hour oral glucose tolerance test. Uh, and for that one, if their blood glucose levels are greater or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter, then they meet the criteria for type 2 diabetes. And lastly, is just a random glucose test. Uh, if someone's blood sugar is tested randomly and it's greater than 200 milligra milligrams per deciliter plus additional symptoms, uh, then they meet the criteria for being diagnosed as type 2 diabetic. Uh, a few notes for A1C, it should be obtained uh, when an individual enters the hospital with hyperglycemia. So that if they're admitted with hyperglycemia, it is recommended uh, to obtain an A1C level. Uh, if a uh, patient is admitted and they uh, have hyperglycemia, but their A1C levels are normal, and there's no past uh, medical history or treatment history for diabetes, then the clinician, the dietitian, uh, would assume that that individual has stress hyperglycemia. The A1C levels are helpful uh, when selecting uh, diabetes treatment regimens once a patient is discharged. For this video, we're primarily going to focus on type 2 diabetes, uh, but just to make the distinction, uh, there is a a type 1 diabetes and type 2. For type 1, um, it has to do with beta cell destruction um, and there's absolute insulin deficiency. Uh, whereas type 2 diabetes, there's this progressive insulin secretion defect, which leads to insulin resistance. Uh, briefly, I want to cover the path pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. It is fairly complex, so we'll, we'll go through it quickly and I'll try to hit some high points. Uh, but first, um, there is a combined uh, progressive insulin secretion defect, which, as we mentioned previously, is insulin resistance. Uh, with type 2 diabetes, um, it, that's going to result uh, when insulin secretion capacity begins to fail, creating a state of relative insulin resistance. Um, insulin resistance is exacerbated by obesity. Uh, particularly in relation to abdominal obesity. Uh, with time, the beta cell mass uh, and function progressively declines, resulting in less secretion of both insulin and amylin. Now, amylin, uh, that is co-secreted with insulin. Uh, it is a 37-amino acid hormone uh, 
Uh, it is secreted in the stomach, in your small intestines, and a primary role of amylin, which is co-secreted with insulin, uh, is that amylin inhibits glucagon. And we'll talk more about glucagon in, in just a second, but uh, that's kind of the, the beginning stages of type 2 diabetes. Secondly, without adequate insulin, the insulin-mediated glucose uptake by skeletal muscles is not sufficient uh, to maintain normal glucose levels. Thirdly, insulin glu glucagon secretion is not balanced. So insulin works to lower your blood sugar level, whereas glucagon works to prevent hypoglycemia, which is when your blood sugars are lower than normal. And in this third phase of the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, we have insulin glucagon secretion is not balanced as it should be. Uh, even though hyperglycemia and high uh, circulation levels of insulin are present, hepatic glucose output rates are elevated because high levels of glucagon and gluconeogenesis. Fourthly and lastly, as uh, far as the, the phases of type 2 diabetes, incretin declines. What is that? Uh, that is a gut peptide that is secreted after nutrient intake and it stimulates insulin. Incretin declines. That means that insulin is not stimulated in a time when it should be, which is when food is consumed. Let's look at some glycemic targets for hospitalized patients. So there was a group of trials or a research study called the Leuven trials uh, that compared intensive glucose control with glucose targets of 80 to 110 milligrams per deciliter uh, to standard glucose targets of 180 to 200 milligrams per deciliter. And from that research study, they found that patient outcomes were improved by using tight glucose control in both the surgical intensive, intensive care unit and the medical intensive care unit. And this, the duration of the study was that for patients that were remaining in the surgical intensive care unit and the medical intensive care unit for more than three days. However, uh, once that practice was adopted and further research was conducted, uh, they found an increased risk of mortality due to induced hypoglycemia using intensive glucose control. Because of increased mortality rates, associated with that um, tight control of glucose levels. Uh, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, as well as the American Diabetes Association, put out recommendations for glycemic targets. <clears throat> so we'll primarily focus on the critically ill patient, um, but the glycemic targets for a critically ill patient, uh, they recommend that you maintain glucose levels uh, between 140 and 180 milligrams per deciliter. For some patients, it can be okay to maintain uh, glucose levels less than 140 milligrams per deciliter for that critically ill patient, uh, but it is not recommended for the glucose levels to be maintained less than 110. It's recommended that we initiate IV insulin uh, infusion for any glucose that is greater than 100. 80 milligrams per deciliter. Now for the non-critically ill patient, uh, there's, there's several recommendations that were put out. Uh, for the pre-meal glucose, they recommend uh, that it's less than 140. For just a random glucose, they recommend that it's less than 180. Uh, they recommend that uh, we reassess the therapy for a pre-meal glucose if that pre-meal glucose is less than 100. They recommend that we change therapy uh, for pre-meal if the pre-meal glucose is less than 70. For a non-critically ill patient, it's recommended to schedule subcutaneous insulin therapy. And kind of the components of that subcutaneous insulin therapy for the non-critically ill patient is going to be a basal insulin, which is a slow-acting insulin, then your nutrition, your food, and then for correctional insulin, for that to be bolus or fast-acting insulin. Prolonged use of sliding scale insulin is discouraged as the primary use of therapy. Now that we have covered some of the glycemic targets that have been recommended, uh, we will look at the recommendations for intravenous insulin therapy. IV insulin therapy should only be administered in ICUs or special medical units by uh, trained personnel or experienced personnel. Also, IV insulin therapy should not be administered on units where the patient would be at risk for undetected hypoglycemia. So 
A patient should be monitored continuously, which we'll get to that in just a second. But you would never want to give IV insulin therapy in a situation where it couldn't be monitored. Uh, the FDA has approved rapid acting insulins uh, for IV infusion, but there is no advantage to using any of these medications in place of regular insulin. So the patient's glucose level should be checked every hour for up to six hours until uh, the, the target has been met and, and the patient has been stabilized. Once the patient has, has reached the, the target of glucose uh, management and they're stable, then we can reduce the frequency of monitoring to every two to three hours. During perennial nutrition or continuous interval feeding, many patients will require approximately double the insulin infusion over the, the level needed for MPO, for a patient not consuming food. Uh, the insulin infusion rate should be decreased to the basal or MPO rate 30 to 60 minutes before perennial nutrition or interval nutrition is discontinued to accommodate the gradual decrease in insulin level. Now, for the patient uh, that is diabetic on interval nutrition, uh, energy requirements or determining those energy requirements is important. Uh, determining, determining an accurate energy requirement is necessary to avoid compl complications associated with intake. When we talk about energy requirements and in term, determining those energy requirements, indirect calimetry remains the gold standard. If you, if you have access to that in your, you know, your work setting, your clinic, then I absolutely use it. But if not, uh, predictive equations can be used. For the healthy population, mifflin St. Jor and the Livingston equation are appropriate. Now, the Mifflin equation is a little more accurate for the the obese patient, whereas the Livingston equation is a little more accurate for non-obese, not critically ill patient. And then for the critically ill population, uh, the Penn State equation is most recommended. Uh, also, the Penn State equation is accurate for obese patients. Uh, it's slightly less accurate for the non-obese, but it is still recommended for the critically ill patient. As far as energy requirements, overfeeding should be avoided in patients with diabetes or hyperglycemia because excessive energy intake can contribute to hyperglycemia. Now, a common complication, gastroparesis is a common, common uh, problem. Uh, gastroparesis, basic definition is delayed gastric emptying. Some common signs of gastroparesis is nausea, vomiting, early satiety, bloating, weight loss, or erratic glucose levels. Um, when you think a diabetic patient and gastroparesis and their nutrient intake, um, you want to think low fat, a low fiber diet, because a high fat diet slows down uh, gastric emptying or gastric motility, and a high fiber diet is poorly digested. So think low fiber, low fat, uh, for someone that has gastroparesis. Uh, patients that uh, require enteral feeding um, and they have gastroparesis, it might uh, be recommended to do a J-tube, a, a jejunostomy, if they have severe gastroparesis, severe uh, delayed gastric emptying, and you can bypass the stomach and feed into the small, test, small intestines via a J-tube. Um, it's important to note that if that happens, if we bypass the stomach and we're feeding them into a J-tube, then uh, the concern for low fat, low fiber no longer matters because we're bypassing the stomach, which is where the delayed gastric emptying is at, and you're feeding into the small intestine. So you can do a standard formula and not necessarily focus on low fat and low fiber in that case. If they are able to consume food by mouth, it's a common practice to let them do that as they are able throughout the day. Um, and then to do intermittent uh, inner nutrition at night. As far as inner nutrition uh, and the indication of it and when we use it, when we don't use it, uh, inner nutrition, we use it when a patient has a functioning GI tract, but they are unable to meet their needs via PO intake. Now, as far as formula selection for the diabetic patient, 
there's several products out there that are marketed as diabetes uh, specific enteral formulas. Um, and those formulas are typically lower in carbohydrates. Uh, they're higher in fat, higher in fiber compared to the standard formula. The protein content of the two are very comparable. Um, there's not much difference there. Uh, the diabetes specific formulas may contain slow digesting carbohydrates, which helps with glycemic index, which would be a lower glycemic index. The use of a fiber containing formula may assist with glucose control by improving the patient's insulin sensitivity as well as lowering the glycemic index. It is important to note that higher fat formulas, which would be your, your diabetes specific formulas, they may exacerbate delayed gastric emptying. Uh, studies investigating long-term use of diabetes-specific formulas, they are scarce. There's not a lot out there. Uh, while diabetes-specific formulas, um, they may be beneficial for some populations, there's no clear benefit or no clear benefit has been determined or demonstrated for routine use in the ICU patient. Therefore, the use of, of these diabetes-specific formulas uh, should be determined on a case-by-case -case basis using clinical judgment. Now, the delivery of inner nutrition for a patient that has diabetes, um, most commonly in a hospital setting, um, for a critically ill patient, a, a, a pump-assisted continuous gastric feeding works great. Uh, and it can even help to improve tolerance. And in most cases, uh, that is the route that is taken for the critical patient. They use pump-assisted continuous gastric feedings. Uh, a small bowel feeding can be used, and it is recommended for a patient um, that is at risk for aspiration or who have gastroparesis. So that'd be a small bowel feeding. Now, concerning insulin therapy during inner nutrition, um, you know, there's two ways to feed a patient. You can do an intermittent or a bolus feed, or you can do a continuous feed. First, for the intermittent and bolus internutrition, uh, basal or basal bolus insulin regimens typically work well for intermittent or bolus enteral feedings because they mimic consistent meal patterns. And uh, just to be clear, when it talks about basal insulin, that's referring to slow acting insulin whereas bolus insulin is referring to fast-acting insulin. Um, options for basal insulin include long-acting agents administered once daily and intermediate-acting agents administered twice daily. Uh, subcutaneous rapid-acting insulin or short-acting insulin is administered before each enteral feeding to account for the carbohydrate content of enteral formula. Uh, the American Diabetes Association uh, guidelines recommend the use of rapid acting insulins over your, your, your regular insulin because rapid acting insulins have a shorter onset of action, which allows for insulin administration immediately before or at the same time of enteral feeding. Also, uh, close monitoring of renal function status is necessary. It's recommended during insulin therapy. Uh, as impaired renal function reduces insulin elimination, which results in prolonged insulin effects and increased risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, hypoglycemia may also occur when enteral nutrition uh, is discontinued or held for procedures or if a patient's MPO. In such cases, if that takes place, rapid or short-acting insulin should not be administered. It should be held. Now, that was concerning intermittent and bolus enteral nutrition regimens for continuous enteral feeding. Um, for the critically ill patient, continuous IV insulin infusions have been shown to be the ideal method uh, to obtain glucose control. Now, it is important to mention that when there are scheduled interruptions um, or when enteral feedings are discontinued without any type of transition to oral intake or prenatal nutrition, insulin should be determined as if the patient is NPO, so as if they're not eating. For example, uh, the insulin infusion rate could be reduced to the basal rate, which is your slow infusion rate, 30 to 60 minutes before discontinuing of enteral feedings to allow for the biological effects of the higher insulin rate to deactivate. 
Uh, another way to prevent hypoglycemia when ill nutrition is stopped is to maintain a 5% dextrose infusion at 5 to 10 milliliters per hour rate while the ill nutrition is infusing and increase the dextrose infusion to 30 to 40 milliliters when enteral nutrition is being held. So I know we've covered a lot concerning management of uh, inner nutrition for a patient that has diabetes. I hope this video has been helpful. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave those in the comment section and we will respond back to you in a timely manner. Uh, we do enjoy you taking the time to watch this video and uh, keep up the good work and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.